In America, a group led by the renowned craniologist Samuel George Morton had begun to collect the skulls of different races and compare them. Skulls were chosen to be measured because it was reckoned that the skull was the container of the most important part of the human body, the brain. The bigger the skull, the bigger the brain. The shape of the skull, the shape of the brain. The American School of Race Scientists concluded that the races, as measured through their skulls, were so different as to be separate species. Tasmanians, Africans, American Indians were not the lower races of men. They were perhaps not fully human at all. One writer compared the extermination of these races by white settlers as being like the melting of snow before the advancing rays of the sun. But the theory that was to have the most powerful impact upon race came not from the anatomists or the skull measurers, but from the work of one of the 19th century's greatest minds. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, and some ape as low as a baboon instead of as now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. Charles Darwin, 1890. Charles Darwin is very well known for writing uh, The Origin of Species in the 1800s. This book gave rise to evolutionary theory. What people don't know is that there was actually uh, a longer original title to this book, and that was On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Now, uh, copies and editions that they made afterwards eliminated that phrase about the favored races. Evidently, they understood then that it was politically incorrect. The social Darwinists predicted a future in which these races, like many animal species, would only be remembered as curios, stuffed exhibits in anthropological museums. The white man's burden and the Christian dream of benign imperialism were rendered obsolete. Race scientists and social reformers visited prisons to study the criminal races, and among them was Charles Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton. Galton was terrified by the fact that the underclass were reproducing faster than the middle classes. Darwinian law had, it seemed, been turned on its head. The least fit were surviving. Reversing this situation became his mission. Darwin had looked backwards. Where had we come from? Galton turned the telescope round and looked forward, where were we going? And he devoted much of the rest of his life to the idea of understanding Homo sapiens, us, as a species, and trying to direct where Homo sapiens was going to go in order to become more sapient, more wise in the future, more of a genius, and less of what he saw, more stupid, more ignorant, and more uh, decayed. Galton designed a new science of human selective breeding he dreamed of encouraging the middle classes to have more children and inhibiting breeding amongst the lower and criminal classes. And he named his new science eugenics. In the last decades of the 19th century, it became widely respected, attracting an array of high-profile supporters. They included many of the great figures of the late 19th, early 20th century, people like George Bernard Shaw, H.G. Wells, uh, Winston Churchill, all of them absolutely convinced eugenicists. In the first years of the 20th century, all the racial theories developed in the Victorian age, eugenics, social Darwinism and scientific racism, came together in a forgotten outpost of colonialism. This is Namibia, but at the dawn of the 20th century, it was the German colony of Southwest Africa and home to an ancient people called the Herero. In 1904, they rebelled against the brutality of German rule. 
What followed was to prefigure the worst crimes of the 20th century. The Germans committed innumerable massacres and atrocities, but they were unable to hunt down and destroy all the Herero people across such a vast landscape. And when the Nama, another of the Namibian peoples, rose up, the Germans turned instead to a recent invention, the concentration camp. In these camps, the Herero and Nama were imprisoned and enslaved. Thousands were worked to death, others raped, beaten, or simply murdered by the guards. The most infamous and deadly of the camps was at a place called Shark Island. Shark Island was established for the express purpose of killing people. Anybody placed on that island, everybody knew they were going to die. People knew that, the German officers knew that. If I were to have to use the language of the Nazi period, then I would certainly see Shark Island as a death camp. The people were together in Shark Island for all over Namibia. Heroes, Tamaras, Bushman, Nama. And they had cool-blooded murder there. My own family, my ancestors, they were also killed there. In this desolate place, on the southern edge of Africa, three and a half thousand people were exterminated with the speed and efficiency that was to become the hallmark of 20th century slaughter. The genocides which took place in Namibia in 1904 to 1909, they are the precursor to what happens in the Nazi period. They are the precursor. They have the same symptoms in the sense that you can see the bureaucratization of mass killing. And this for me is the central thing. It's not just killing for killing, no. It's a combination between killing and bureaucracy. Today, Shark Island is a campsite for tourists. The Africans who were frozen and starved to death here have been almost erased from memory. But a century after the Namibian genocide, the true horror of what happened on Shark Island is beginning to re-emerge. In a recently discovered mass grave, just a few kilometers from the site of Shark Island, lie some of the victims of the 20th century's first genocide. Other victims were denied even the meager dignity of a mass grave. They became the raw material of racial science. Their skulls and even severed heads were sold to museums in Europe and used to prove the inferiority of Africans. The trade in skulls was so accepted that it was even depicted on a postcard. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. The break between man and his nearest allies will then be wider, for it will intervene between man and a more civilized state, and some ape as low as a baboon instead of as now between the Negro or Australian and the gorilla. <laughs> 